good evening and welcome. I'm Tracy Pratt, one of the founders of Just Us Somerville. It is my distinct pleasure to moderate tonight's forum between the candidates for state senate representing the second Middlesex district in Massachusetts. The candidates for the candidates of the hour are the incumbent Pat Jalen and the challenger Gary Fisher. This evening's event is hosted by the Somerville Media Center and co-sponsored by Somerville Stands Together, Our Revelation Somerville, and Just Us Somerville. The sponsors have decided on the rules for tonight's forum, compiled the questions, selected the moderator, and have distributed the forum's rules to the candidates. The rules are as follows. Candidate opening statements, closing statements, and primary question responses will be limited to two minutes each. The moderator will have the discretion to ask short follow-up questions, and candidate responses, follow-up responses will be limited to one minute. The, moderate, the moderator will al alert candidates when their time has expired, and candidates are asked to respect the time limits so that we can get all the questions that are prepared asked. Candidates should follow moderator instructions and should not interrupt each other or the moderator. Candidates, do you understand the rules? Yes. Yes, thank you. Let's begin in alphabetical order by yes. last name, starting with Mr. Fisher. Please provide your two minute opening statement. Okay. Good evening, residents of Second Middlesex County. Thank you for tuning in. I am humble to be here. And I also wanted to allow people to know that I am somewhat condone, uh, my condolences to those people who have lost people at COVID-19. Being as that's the case, I hope that we all look forward to healthy conditions for everyone and also make sure that we stay vigilant in making sure that others don't get sick. I want to thank some of those st st um, stands together. I also want to thank our revolution, Somerville, and I want to be aware, I want people to be aware that these, th oh, I'm sorry, the third organization I wanted to um, recognize is, uh, is, oh, hold on one second, please. I also want to be, I want to introduce myself um, I'm a resident of Cambridge. I've been a lifelong resident of Cambridge. I attended Bar uh, Cambridge Public Schools from K to 12, going on to college at UMass Boston, Boston College, then started work in Boston Public Schools, taught there for 32 years, member of the Boston Teachers Union for 32 years. From there, I was, had two positions, a building rep, as well as a part of the contract negotiation team. 10 seconds left, Mr. Fisher. Um, I want people to be aware that I really believe in education and fairness for housing for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Senator Jalen, two minutes, please. Okay, thank you, Tracy. And I want to thank all the people that work to make this forum possible. We're so lucky to have the Somerville Media Center as a venue, and I'm grateful for all the people who built Somerville Stands Together, Just Us Somerville and Our Revolution, that have called us together tonight. To introduce myself, I've, I've represented people in Somerville for many years as your senator, your representative, and on Ward 2 School Committee member. There's a lot to talk about, but I want to tell you about one bill I'm very proud of today. In 2016, I was lead author of Massachusetts' pay equity bill, 
that said people have to be paid equally for equal work. It had provisions intended to make equity real and not just a goal. We were the first state in the country to say employers can't ask about an applicant's prior salary history. We thought that if women or people of color had been poorly paid in one job, that would mean they got paid less in their future jobs. I just found out yesterday that a new study shows that in states that pass this policy, the average job changer makes 5% more, women make 8% more, and black people make 15% more than in states without that policy. It's extremely satisfying to know that thousands of people are being paid more fairly and more adequately because of the work we did with other legislators and especially with advocates for women's organizations. I'm just so lucky to have a job that lets me do that kind of work in every issue area, in education, in transportation, in housing, in labor law, in healthcare, in public safety, in the budget. My focus has always been Ten seconds left. In equity. So that means making structural changes in education, healthcare, pay, and law enforcement. And that will take deep and sustained efforts by lots of people who haven't had power before. Time. Thank you. All right. And now on to the questions. As a reminder, you have two minutes to answer. And we are limited in time. So please respect the time, the process, and your opponent. On to the questions. The first question is health care. And Senator Jalen, you will be the first to respond. Health care, with, with millions of job losses occurring in the midst of the public health crisis presented by COVID-19, it is clear that health care must be a human right rather than a privilege conditioned on employment status. Do you support a public health, a public single payer health insurance system for Massachusetts that would replace private employer provided plans? If you do, how would such a plan work? And how would you ensure a just transition for workers displaced by this shift? If you don't support a single payer plan, what healthcare reforms would you propose to deal with the pandemic? Senator that's, Jalen. That's two minutes, really. <laughs> uh, the single payer bills that have been filed in the past, including the ones that I have filed, run to dozens or hundreds of pages. I'm not going to try to do that. I'm going to say that moving to a system that is not employer based would be beneficial. Uh, to the economy, to individuals, to the healthcare system, and it would save a lot of money. It would require uh, increasing taxes, but it would allow people not to pay their healthcare premiums and therefore not to have to pay for all of the extra paperwork and bureaucracy and cost shifting that goes on now in the current system. So people in Vermont tried uh, to do a single payer, but they lacked uh, the power to overcome institutional inertia and the power of money, and there is a lot of money uh, in maintaining the current system. Any structural change will require massive mobilization over a long period of time. Thank you. And Mr. Fisher. I do agree with the single payer concept. Um, however, I do not want to force people into it. I believe that, especially those people who have had unions negotiate their health care, they're not willing to give it up willingly. But we know when someone's unemployed, they no longer have health. And I believe that they should have that option to get into Med uh, Medicare for All or a system that would be available for everyone. Um, through this process, this will give them a backup as well as a availability to do other jobs and don't have to worry about health insurance. It's a right that everyone should have. It's not something that is required or based in money. Um, we saw that with this um, virus, that this has caused people to lose jobs and, and 
they have to worry about their health care. I remember a story of um, Barack Obama's mom um, dying in, uh, because of cancer and, and she was fooling around um, trying to get health care to pay for her treatment, but she didn't have the um, funds available. So that concept in and of itself tells us that we have to have health care available for everyone whenever in need. So that may be a variation, and I agree with um, J um, Senator Jalen in saying that it's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult, but we have to allow for this to happen, and it may take time to do it because not everyone's going to be willing to give up what they have and um, to pay into something that is not available. Tracy, can I just say something? I think people should know. It's real important for people to know that Massachusetts does cover over 95% oh. of their people and people who lose their jobs right now, there are open enrollments so people can join through connector care. People should not be scared of losing their uh, insurance when they lose their job. So Massachusetts has actually done very well without already with without going to single payer. So that's, I think that's important for people to know. Okay, thank you so much for that. And Mr. Fisher, do you have a response? You were both under the two minutes. So um, if you have a response for that as well, please feel free very quickly. Uh, as a Senate, as someone that's a candidate, I would like to think that being able to talk to the people to get their feedback is important. Sometimes we may have more information and it's important to be out there getting that information. Now, Senator Jalen just made a good point, but how many people know about that except for those who are at the, the, under the gold dome in, uh, at the state house? We have to be able to give that service and that information out there to everyone. And that's important so we could all make good decisions. Okay, thank you so much, both of you. On to housing, this next question, Mr. Fisher, you will provide the first response. Housing, the Commonwealth's eviction moratorium expires at the end of August. Do you support extending it? And do you support rent cancellation? Beyond the, pre beyond the present public health crisis, what general policy reforms do you support to protect tenants and to make housing a right for all. Mr. Fisher. Okay. I do s believe that they should extend the rent um, isolation for, uh, for a bit longer. However, we have to take into consideration that a lot of people rely on these rents to live on. So to say that to eliminate those rents uh, completely meaning that you're cutting into people's livelihood. Um, I think that the state should come up with ways to support these needs for these individuals, especially because of this, the conditions of this virus has caused on, put on a lot of people. So we have to, in fact, adjust for these things. Um, I think that overall, rents gotta be, housing is very important and rents have to be reasonable and affordable. Um, so if, even if we wait on um, come back in, building to that point where people can have rents at a lower rate, building to a point where they can have the opportunity to build up to a rate that it will be supportive by and helped by the state. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Senator Jalen. So I actually worked really hard on the eviction um, moratorium and also on the mortgage for, uh, forbearance bill. I certainly support extending it. The reason we did it was because we don't want people put out on the street in the middle of a pandemic. We don't want more people in homeless shelters. So right now I'm, I am supporting a, uh, an extension, but also uh, we have a bill uh, which I've, I'm co-sponsoring to right to counsel in eviction cases. Tenants are often come come to eviction unarmed against a landlord who will have uh, legal representation. I also support, um, we have increased the raft funding for people who need assistance to get through a short-term uh, crisis and keep their housing. Um, I support the, the local option rent control bill, which would allow communities to do 
rent st stabilization, as, as Gary calls it, um, on it, reacting to the local situation. The communities that had rent control when it was abolished by statewide referendum all voted to keep it. The communities that voted against rent control didn't have it. So, and the last, yeah, I guess the last thing I would say is that I don't know why landlords are continuing to raise rents, in, even on restaurants, when they know they're not going to get another tenant if they lose this tenant. If they put a restaurant out of business, if they lose a good tenant, they're not going to get another one soon. So I hope landlords are going to think about, in the future, about uh, be more moderate, moderate in their demands. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm, we're out of time. So we're going to go to the third question. Question three, Senator Jalen, you will be the first to respond. And the topic is environment. The devastating impacts of the ongoing climate crisis fall hardest on the working class and disproportionately on our immigrant communities and people of color. To confront the climate crisis, we need a Green New Deal for Massachusetts that recognizes that we can't have environmental justice without racial and economic justice. Here's the question. What goals do you think should be central to a Massachusetts Green New Deal? What is one specific action you would take immediately next session and what is one ongoing strategy you will employ throughout your term to advance a Green New Deal based on these values? Senator Jalen. Let me first confess that this is not, my primary expertise is in education, uh, elder affairs, and uh, labor and workforce development. So. I generally take guidance from the Sierra Club, from uh, Environmental League of Massachusetts, from my colleagues like uh, Senator Barrett, who has proposed a carbon, uh, carbon fee. Uh, so I think our goals need to be reduce uh, the use of fossil fuels uh, and to increase uh, the amount of solar and wind energy and to make sure that those jobs are not in China. Uh, and go to people who need those jobs. So I, I plan to continue to work with my colleagues um, on trying to advance those goals. Uh, some of it has to do with how you, um, how you allocate costs, um, whether you allow new, uh, new pipelines in. I have, tried, I have passed successfully in the Senate to avoid having new pipelines funded by the ratepayers um, so it, I think there are many issues that, these are not short answer questions. I'm going to complain to the people who write MCAS if they do things like this. So I would not do well in this, if this was a standardized test. It's too short, a, too long an answer, too long. Okay. I can't be here in two minutes. Okay, thank you so much for your response and I did not write the question. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Fisher. Okay, the first important aspect of the Green New Deal is to eliminate these fossil fuels and help the environment to clear from some of these poisons. I would first look for jobs and help that there be more jobs created under the Green Deal, New Green Deal and helping people to adjust or to adapt to a change. Um, the first thing we should look at is cutting out emission in the, bar, in the high um, city, uh, big city areas like Boston, Springfield, and so forth. We need to make sure that there's less emission in, um, or carbon burning in these areas. So I would ask that public transportation be used and keep these, the public transit um, uh, available to these people, um, leaving them outside the area in which they can park their cars and travel into the city with the, um, the public transportation. I would also ask that um, many more people adjust to the um, solar panels on their homes. Having these solar panels will cut out some of these fossil fuel burning 
or even going to electricity to allow them to change and um, adjust to this new Green New Deal. I also believe that beyond the fossil fuels and the solar panels, there needs to be a change in some of the motor vehicles that we are driving today. Hybrid is good. However, we can go to electric cars. We don't need to be traveling um, that far a distance when we have more use of the public transportation. I think these things should help us adjust and reduce some of this carbon burning. I also, think, I also believe that we should stop track, um, fracking. Fracking is a, a problem with how we're getting these fuels, these fossil fuels to uh, in our environment. Okay. I'll, All right. Thank you so much for your response. And thank you both of you because we're doing excellent on time. Uh, I just have to get to our next question. So question number, oh, I'm sorry. Question number four, let me make sure that is the right question. We just did environment. Question number four, systemic racism. And Mr. Fisher, you'll be the first to respond. Systemic racism. Since August 20th, 1619, the day the first enslaved Africans arrived in Jamestown and through the 401 subsequent years of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, mass incarceration, and violent policing of black communities, racism has been a consistent thread woven into the fabric of America. How have race and culture affected your life and how and how would that inform your work and relationships with your constituents? Okay. Mr. As you all see, I am a black man. Being such, I have had quite a few experiences in which I was assessed before I even spoke to anybody um, in a negative way. I have been confronted by police. I have been accused by police. I also been uh, falsely um, accused by pedestrians, I will call them, um, based upon that. But systemic racism is a problem that we all have to deal with, not just black people. I believe white people should be dealing with it as well. It's a system that has been poisoning the, the adjustment or the evaluation of individuals based upon their skin color. Now, Boston, I mean, police period have been taught to, through the system, systematic process, how to deal with black people or brown people. Um, and through that process, they have a hostile expectation or they expect the negative before they get anything out of the, anyone that they confront. This is not just based on the police of the white police this is also the system that will adapt or turn black police into a part of this system as well. We have to first teach our children that this is not the way it should be. Second, we have to then support their efforts and teach the adults that are teaching our children that how this should work, not the way that it's working now. 25 seconds. With this process, I believe that people will start getting to understand. And once people understand, they will eliminate some of their negativity towards each other. We have to live together. Everybody gives up a little bit of themselves in a society in order for us to be homogeneous. Let us all keep this on, on point. Thank you. Thank you for that response. And Senator Jalen. Well, this is a really hard question. Um, I was born in Texas. Um, I had pretty racist ancestors, including grandparents I love. My father left, we left Texas. Uh, my father was fired for integrating the Methodist student movement. Um, I grew up in a family in a pretty white community in, in Newton. Um, but I grew up in a family that was participating in um, the civil rights movement and the peace movement 
now my family, uh, I have three granddaughters that live with me, two are bright, racial and one is black. Um, I've learned so much from them about their experience. They, two of them graduated from Somerville High this year. <laughs> I just listen at the dinner table and I learn a great deal that I would not have without them. So my main goal right now is being listening to people who have been affected by racism and by violence and by discrimination. Our office was closed on Friday for Juneteenth uh, to do reading and reflection. And I actually learned a great deal. I read um, and watched David Harris, who's at the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute. Um, and I'm trying to change and not say criminal justice anymore. My language is gonna be important in what I'm learning. Uh, but, and in legislating, I'm planning to take leadership. 25 seconds. I am taking leadership from the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus, um, listening to their priorities and supporting them. In the Senate, there's only Sonia Chang Diaz and I work closely with her. Okay, thank you for your response. I am going to give a follow-up question to that and you will each have one minute in which to respond. Um, so the, the second part of the question was relationships uh, with your constituents. So how has your experience informed your relationships with them? I would love for you both to speak to relationships with white constituents. How will your background inform your work regarding systemic racism with your white constituents. Um, and I will have Senator Jalen go first. You have one minute. I'm gonna have to think about that. That's, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, one of the things that's been so valuable to me in becoming Senator, um, is that there is a very organized uh, black community in West Medford. And I have been really lucky to listen to people there and also um, get to know some of the people in Zonta. But I'm particularly happy now that there is uh, new leadership emerging in Somerville, um, which I will hope to take more, more guidance from. Um, but I think all of us in all communities need to be in listening mode a great deal of the time. I, I do write, I write a newsletter. Um, I get a lot of response. I get hundreds of emails a day. <laughs> and so I, but I would like to have more. 10 seconds. Individual commentary and people talking to me about their own lives. I get a lot of that, um, but I, I welcome that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fisher? Um, I spend a lot of time listening, um, basically um, to get a good sense of where people are coming from. One of the things that I've learned over the years is that people are more truthful and more forthcoming when you allow them to speak freely. Whether this be white, black, or indifferent. I know you asked me about, me, the question based upon white. Um, most people want to be good. And I have a lot of people that have spoken to me, but then they get intimidated because sometimes a white person can't say certain things to a black person. And they have to more or less adjust or, or be careful around that. So you may not get the full sense of what's coming forth from them. And sometimes you have to be able to sit back and allow it to happen, and even encourage them at some time to hear what they're saying. My communication with white people has been good as far as I'm concerned. I've listened to the point that I'm able to negotiate a contract that they would want to see because um, I'm listening. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna move on to the fifth question. This is transportation. Um, Senator Jalen, 
I know you just responded first, but that was a follow-up. So you're going to respond first to this one, and Mr. Fisher will respond second. Um, and this is on transparency and accountability. Many bills with large numbers of co-sponsors never get a floor vote session. Never, I'm sorry, I'm going to start all over. Many bills with large numbers of co-sponsors never get a floor vote session after session. What would you do differently to help ensure that needed progressive legislation actually gets passed? Senator Jalen, when you're ready. That's an extraordinarily frustrating situation. And we have uh, bills right now with 100 sponsors, which is half the legislature, um, which we are trying to get to the floor. I think getting in, getting things moved in the process is extremely difficult sometimes. And that's why I think, I continue to think that uh, you don't get anything done inside the state house without major outside involvement uh, by people have to be willing to be in it for the long haul. They have to go to demonstrations, but they also have to go to meetings and they have to sign petitions and they have to write letters and they have to visit and they have to get to know their legislators and they have to run and they have to vote. There's a lot of work to making change and let me tell you, <laughs> I think you will not find many legislators who don't feel frustrated a great deal of the time. Because with thousands of bills filed, many of them good, some of them bad, um, in my opinion, uh, it is hard to get through, get to the front of the line. And right now I'm so frustrated because COVID is taking all of our attention, we have really good bills ready to roll. And I also feel frustrated because I think this is such a critical moment in history with so many people mobilized and so much attention. And the legislative session ends July 31st. I am pushing really hard to extend the session and to make it possible for us to keep going with this momentum. We're not going anywhere else. We should, be in, we should be acting and keeping going at this moment. Thank you so much. And Mr. Fisher. I believe that the system is faulty. Um, when you have, uh, like, Ms., uh, like Senator Jalen just mentioned, you have 100 people signing on to co-sponsor a bill, but yet we don't have the, the, enough people to pass the bill. We have a problem. Um, there's, we need to make sure that people in the public are aware of where their senators and representatives are in these, in these instances. Meaning that if my senator is opposing this bill and I want this bill to pass, people need to know. People need to get involved. People need to force these people who are working for you to vote in the way you want them to vote. What they have these different bills and everyone just wants to look good opposed to doing good. And that's where the problems come in. There should be everyone talking, negotiating, and trying to get something that everyone can vote on passed. The transparency of a bill being passed has to be put out there for all of us to be aware of. And that's not what's happening. When you have so many people sponsoring bills, and nobody pass and they're being not being passed with all these sponsors onto it, then we have a problem. We also have a problem when we have the majority of representatives at, in the legislature as Democrats, and we can't get some of these things passed. We need to look at this process. We need to adapt some of these rules that help these things move forward. And we need to make sure, in fact, that these bills get to where they need to be so that the people have, a, have something that they can move forward. We need to improve people's lives, not seconds. sit back and wait for things to happen. We need to make that difference. We don't need everyone to protest to make change. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, 
this is our sixth and final official question. And the topic is jobs. Uh, Mr. Fisher, you will be the first to respond. The pandemic has forced many workers to choose between their health and feeding their families. Unsafe work conditions with weak federal safety and health enforcement, low wages that made it impossible for people to save up for such an emergency, and lack of paid sick time have all disproportionately impacted low, low wage workers, immigrant workers, and workers of color. What measures will you take to address these issues? Mr. Fisher. Okay. Wage is something that is necessary and, and vital for people. Not just wages, but a living wage. A living wage is important. And we need to make sure that people have a living wage and something where this living wage would be available even when it's a uh, pandemic like what's happening now. In Europe, they don't have what we call an unemployment system. In Europe, they have a system in which you're paying regularly and it doesn't, when you're not, um, when, uh, you're not getting paid, you just get your same salary. We have a reduction in salary when we get this um, unemployment, we have a process in which you have to go through to get this unemployment, and we don't all have that possibility to get that un um, unemployment because some people do service jobs in which they rely on tips and things like that. That in and of itself causes the problem for people to be able to collect unemployment and to be able to live when a pandemic like this comes into play. We have to adjust some of our systems to make sure that people are able to live before and after these pandemics. We have to make sure our system is helping people to support people and to improve their lives. We can improve people's lives if we don't in fact make some change to help them to move forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Senator Jalen. Wow, I, this is, uh, yes. Uh, so, about, they say the unemployment rate is 13 or 15 percent. It's, if you look at the actual number of workers and the number of people collecting unemployment, it's about a quarter of people in Massachusetts are currently not employed. Many people are ineligible because of their immigration status, and we have been concerned about that. If you don't file a W-2 or a 1040, you can, if you file an ITIN, you can pay taxes and not be eligible for unemployment. So we're trying to make that happen. That's only fair. They pay taxes. They should be collecting unemployment. Unemployment right now, because the federal uh, $600 a week is actually better for low-income people um, than it's, it's, for some people, it's better than working. Um, but I mean, in terms of income. Um, but we have had incredible problems with the federal um, PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, people getting shut off, people get not getting in when they should because of the scam. Uh, that's one of the things we're working on. But I want to pick up on one thing uh, that Mr. Fisher said, which is about the tipped employees. Uh, many tipped employees, because the employer doesn't report their full income, they, but because they don't report all of the tips that the person has gotten, they then become un, un, ineligible for regular unemployment. They have been able to get in the PUA program, but not getting the kind of, of benefits that they should. Tipping is a remnant of slavery. It is, uh, it is, it, we are working to try to make sure that everyone is not paid a sub-minimum wage, but a real minimum wage. That it would be only one part of the solution. But are you gonna let me talk? I don't know how many seconds I have. <laughs> um, none. Finish your sentence, finish your sentence. Oh, it was a thought. Okay, all right. So that was the end of our uh, formal questions. We do have a lightning round prepared and what we will do because we do have a few moments left. So for the lightning round, you simply would answer yes or no as to whether you agree 
with a particular act or statement. I'm going to read the act or statement and you just simply respond yes or no. We will start with Senator Jalen. Um, also, both of you res will respond to each one. You don't give an explanation, yes or no. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. That was good practice. Yes, it All was. Right. <laughs> the Roe Act, which would expand access to abortion, ensuring that anyone, regardless of age, income, or insurance, can access safe, legal abortion here in Massachusetts. Senator Jalen, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Fisher? Yes. Thank you. Safe Communities Act. Mr. Fisher, you'll be first to respond, which among, some, which among other things would limit state and local law enforcement cooperation with ICE and keep state tax dollars from supporting federal immigration law enforcement. Mr. Fisher? Yes. Senator Jalen? Yes. All right, and finally, the Fair Share Amendment, which would raise revenue by taxing a portion of a person's annual income above $1 million. Senator Jalen? Yes. Mr. Fisher? Yes. All right, we are wrapping up and we are going to end with final statements. You have two minutes for your final statement. Mr. Fisher, please begin. I want to thank Somerville Scans Together, Our Revolution of Somerville, and Just Us Somerville for putting this on. Um, I believe it was successful. And I wish to acknowledge that. Housing, however, I think is a very vital concept that we need to deal with. The renting is out of control. The average rent in Cambridge is $37,356 per year. And the average income is $86,000 per year for a, Cambridge, a Canterbridgean. That meaning is 50% of their income is going towards rent. In Somerville, the average income is $69,000 a year. And the rents in Somerville is $35,000 per year, which again is 50% of their income going towards rent. Rent should not be more than 30% of one's income. And 50% is way too much. This forces people to make decisions that they cannot afford to, to, to make, meaning how they eat, what they do, where they live. This has to be um, restricted or adapted. Education. Education is not on the level it should be. One of the major reasons why is because class sizes are too large. Class sizes should not be more than 20. To be honest with you, if you look at the successful schools, the public, I mean private schools, you'll find that their class sizes are 12. No one goes above 12. All the, the teachers um, attention goes to those individuals during that time frame. Also, resources is a vital aspect of education. 15 seconds. To the point where we don't give technology, we give antiquated um, materials to our students annually. This cannot continue. We have to make sure the teachers are supported and stop forcing teachers to teach under more than one certification. This is how we can correct this problem. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Senator Jalen. So thank you, and I wanna say we can't make structural change without taking on really powerful forces. It will take sustained large scale involvement by a lot of people who haven't had power in the past. Millions of people around the country are making this an incredibly important moment. The murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, Tony McDade, I'm at Arbery. Those are just the most recent, most publicized ones, but they've broken through something. People are turning out every single day in huge marches, but also in tiny ones that people organize hyper locally. We can't waste this once in a century opportunity to make real change. The most obvious demands of the Black Lives Movement in, require rethinking the role of police in prisons. We, sh we should not build new prisons. The number of incarcerated people is dropping. We should reinvest the savings in education, housing, healthcare, and things that give people opportunity. 
many 911 calls can be answered more effectively and def definitely more safely by someone who specializes in, for example, mental health crises. The Black Lives Movement has coincided with the coronavirus to reveal vast inequality across the board in education, in healthcare, in income, in housing, inequality we knew about but our government ignored. We can't let this moment pass without making major changes that we couldn't make in the past because of the powerful opposition. We need to fully fund the Student Opportunity Act, increase investment in the education of, to increase in, educate, funding of the children, of the education of children whose families have low incomes. We need to increase the pay of the lowest paid human service workers and childcare workers. And this will cost a lot of money. We have a six billion dollar deficit. We need more state aid, federal aid, but we have cut $3 billion of taxes in the last 20 years. We have a lot of things I can propose, but we should not be afraid to ask those who are doing very, very well, even in these tough times, to contribute their share to rebuilding our economy fairly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Jalen. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, for giving us your time. I'd also like to thank those of you who are viewing from wherever you may be. We appreciate the time you have taken. Thank you to the Somerville Media Center for hosting. Thank you to the three co-sponsors, Just Us Somerville, woo woo, uh, <laughs> Our Revelation Somerville, and also to uh, Our Revolution Somerville, I'm sorry, our ORS, and um, also SST, Somerville Stands Together. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening.